Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Hope y'all are doing well. Hope y'all are staying cool during this very, very hot, hot summer. Or possibly warm if you're watching this in the future. Um, either way, I'm going to go ahead and start this off real quick. This is Without a Camera by Brackish Volume 1. And as the title suggests, um, we'll be going over by Brackish Volume 1 from the Criterion Collection. Now, you do not have to purchase this set in order to own it. It is completely not necessary. All of Brackish's shorts, or at least most of his shorts, but all of the ones that I found on the Volume 1 DVD are all available online through YouTube or Vimeo or other such means. So you can all find those there. About a year or so ago, I wanted to get into Brackage. Uh, and the problem with that is Brackage is, he has a very extensive career. Um, whereas certain directors who have very extensive careers, like for example, Ingmar Bergman. Ingmar Bergman has 66 writing credits on Letterboxd and 70 director's credits, okay? But that's not even including his books or stage plays. That's just his films. But it's very easy to go through Stan Brack, or my bad, uh, Ingmar Bergman's filmography and find out which of the films are the most popular, which ones are cult favorites, which ones are considered the best, which ones are, you know... Critic favorites, which ones are personal favorites? It, it's 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 very easy to kind of sort through and, and wade through the list of uh, Bergman films and and find yourself a nice starting place. The problem with Stan Brakhage is there's not really a whole lot of easy ways to start into his career, mainly because between the years 1954 and 2003, he made 350 films, which is a lot. And so looking at a list of 350 plus films and figuring out which specific singular one to start with is a very overwhelming and daunting task. It can be very, very draining. So uh, that's why I got the DVD collection from Criterion Collection. Uh, volume 1 by Bracket because it has 26 of his most famous and influential and most important shorts. It, it's really just the, the place to start. So uh, recently I, I, I double dipped and I got the Blu-ray because I love the DVD so much that I bought the Blu-ray edition which has both volumes 1 and 2 on it. And because I had the Blu-ray I didn't need the DVD anymore and I gave it to uh, a buddy of mine. Uh, I gave it to Quinn and to Allison and after I gave them that DVD I went back and started going through Brackage's films again and kind of like just scrolling through you know rewatching some of them and I realized that I had made possibly a terrible mistake um, to handing someone a Brackage DVD who has no interest in watching Brackage and has no idea who Stan Brackage is is a really chaotic thing to do uh, so, Allison, Quinn with one N, and anyone else out there who may possibly have an interest in watching any of the things on that DVD of oddities and experimental art, please consider watching this video before, after, or during your viewing experience. Uh, there are three pillars of brackage. Now, the three pillars of brackage are content, format, and environment. So, content, as far as content goes, Stan Brackage famously once said that his films are about birth, sex, death, and the search for God. This is surprisingly true for 100% of his films. Um, all of them, no matter how narrative or bizarre, abstract, absurd, highbrow, lowbrow, graphic, disturbing, beautiful, are all fascinated with birth, sex, death, and higher stranger powers. Now, I'll, I'll talk more about that specifically as I get into each individual film, but there's a lot of philosophical speculation and introspection in these films, which is why I really love him, because he poses a lot of questions without saying a whole lot. Now, format. I'm sure you read the title of the video, or you heard me repeat it earlier, and you probably want to know exactly what without a camera means. Well, Brackage was known for pushing the envelope of film as an art. Between 1952 and 2000, oh my bad, 1954 and 2003, again, he made over 350 films. This man wanted to challenge filming so badly that he actually spent several years making films without using a camera. How did he do that? Well, he stained, painted, light leaked, cut, and taped things onto 16 and 35 millimeter rooms of film, and then ran them through projectors to see their final desired effects. 
Now, not all of his films are like this, but some of his most famous and beloved films are. And even the ones that were made with cameras usually involve ideas of multi-layered images, tracks, and superimposed visual tricks. He was part filmmaker, part painter, part animator, part photographer, part poet, but regardless of all that, he was a complete, true artist, and he was incredible. Finally, we have environment. One of the things that makes Stan so impenetrable is the fact that he rarely uses sound in his shorts. He didn't hate music. In fact, some of his films were made as a collaborations with musicians, but he thought that adding sounds to most of his films would distract the viewer from technical ability and what he was supposed to be showing you, what he wanted you to see. Personally, I'm gonna play some sick background tunes through this video, as I'm sure I'm doing right now. But when you watch these by yourself, you have two options. You can play your own music and hope that it'll match up well, or you can sit in total silence for most of these. That's up to you. But now that all of that is out of the way, let's get specifically into the shorts, starting with Desi's film. Desi's film is, well, first off, if you're gonna watch this with music, I recommend using Don Amon by Slint as the background. It works so perfectly. The, the length, the lyric, the tone of the guitars, and the sound of the music just just put on Don Amon by Slint as you watch Desist film and you can thank me later, okay? So Desist film is about four young men and a young woman who sit in boredom. She smokes while one of them strums a lute, one of them looks at a magazine and two fiddle with strings. The door opens and in comes a fifth young man with a cigarette between his lips and a swagger upon his face. The young woman laughs at him. The fifth man and the woman become a couple as the other four young men continue to take place in disconnected activities. When the four realize that something has changed, first they stare at the couple who have kissed and are now dancing slowly. The four run from the house in a frenzy and return to the house to stare at them. The power of sex has unnerved them. Though this is one of his more narrative works, and I use that word very lightly here, mind you. There is an identifiable solipsism that exists in his filmography. This needed to be as silent as his other works are, because this one actually has sound and noises, but I don't like the way that he ever uses sound. In fact, I would prefer 100% of his films to be silent. Um, but the moral of the story is very interesting, and the idea that sex evokes violence is a very showing thought that Brackish put to his film that would really reveal who he would become later in, 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 in his work. Next up is Wedlock House and Intercourse. We see a film negative of a nude couple embracing in bed. Then, back in regular black and white images, we see them alone together, clothed at home. It's nighttime, and she sees his reflection in the window, and she closes the drapes, hiding him. After sex, again back into black and white negatives, they sit, smoke, and have a coffee. They kiss, she smiles, they light candles. The images are often very quick, and the camera angles occasionally are off kilter. The room is sometimes dark, and sometimes lit as if by a rotating searchlight. The images again appear negative when they return to bed. Calling things Lynchian is out. I'm gonna start referring to these nightmarishly strange and somehow familiar suburban art as Brackish-esque from now on. This is most seriously the eraser head before eraser had existed, a sleep paralysis hallucination of conjugal pleasure and domestic isolation from the bleakest pits of the arrangement that most people call marriage. The people here are empty. I mean, sure they have sex, sure they share coffee and cigarettes, but there's no words between them. There's no smiles, no gestures, it feels cold and empty. The whole house feels truly locked, damaged, and dangerous. It's unnerving, but I love it. Contention versus coitus, conjugation versus consummation. Dog Star Man is an experimental film that follows a cycle of seasons as well as the stretch of a single day as a man and his dog slowly ascend a mountain. Dog Star Man is a film that exists within a surreal and uncertain realm of artistry. What a wave of emotions. What a weird and humbling trip. So, when Brackage was living with his first wife and his parents, he asked his dad if there's anything he could do to help around the house. He was unemployed at the time and he didn't want to feel like a total waste of space, so his dad told him to go up on the mountain and cut wood, which is exactly what he did. And this is partially the filming of that activity, shown at the moment when he climbs and wrestles a dead tree. Many consider this to be Brackage's masterpiece, so that means it's both breathtaking and also simultaneously boring as shit to get through, mainly because it's over an hour long and it's dead silent. Each part 
has numbered images and tracks to superimpose on each other as the parts go along the number line. For example, part 2 has 2 tracks, part 3 has 3 tracks, and part 4 has 4 superimposed tracks that all play at the same time. Part 2 talks about family history, part 3 is a sexual daydream, and part 4 supposedly ends with a cosmic death and a sense of haunted failure. I don't know why this needed to be over an hour long, but who am I but a loser watching movies in his room instead of mingling with the outside world? The act of seeing with one's own eyes. So, I can't show most of this one, so I'm gonna make this real quick. The act of seeing with one's own eyes is shot at a morgue where f forensic pathologists conduct autopsies of the corpses assigned to them. My friends and letterbox mutuals will know me as the film that I reviewed by saying, I love seeing old people getting skinned and disemboweled with a bunch of heart emojis. The problem with this is that Brackage had to sign a bunch of NDAs to film and release this, and he had to pay off a bunch of pop to drive him around the city and, and basically get him into the building to film this. So we don't really know a whole lot about this short. He couldn't show identifiable features or faces. He couldn't really give a whole lot of credit to anyone for helping him shoot this. So it is very, very hush-hush and kind of mysterious. This one is pretty infamous though. Uh, mainly in underground horror and extreme film circles, which makes it funny that it's been given such a pristine place here in the Criterion collection. Catch Cradle is images of two women and two men in a gray cat that form a montage of rapid bits of movement. One woman is in a bedroom, the other one wears an apron. They both work with their hands, occasionally looking upwards. A man enters a room and a woman smiles. He sits and another man sits in smoke. The cat stretches, there is close-ups of each, the light is dim, and the filter accentuates red. A bare foot stands on a satin sheet. A woman disrobes. She pets the cat. It's the same old stand, the same old abstract oddities, the same old flavors. This one feels warmer, though, with cherry reds and glowing oranges that seem to both leak onto and through the frames of the film. Domesticated American lives from the view of a cat. This would be a Lana Del Rey video in another life. I know that a lot of people say that his films are very, very shoegaze, which is true. Stan Brakhage is extremely shoegaze. He's very fuzzy and abstract and bizarre and very noisy. But this one specifically, I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of sexual tension. There's these human standard rituals that seem alienated and weird as we watch our own existence through the eyes of something else. Uh, this is basically an example of pre-psychedelia psychedelia with no water baby moving. Um, yeah, I can't show this one on here at all whatsoever, uh, but I'm gonna make it quick. On a winter's day, a woman stretches near a window and then sits in a bathtub of water. She's happy. Her husband is nearby and there's close-ups of her face, her pregnant belly, and his hands caressing her. This is a very beautiful, sensual, glowing little short film. It it's really wonderful and it's very, very touching. The part I can't really show especially is the part where she gives birth and we see the crowning of the baby's head and then the birth itself. And then we watch a pair of hands tie off and cut the umbilical cord with the help of the attending hands. The mother expels placenta and then the infant nurses. And from time to time, we get to return to the bath scene uh, showing the dad's excitement and the resting of the mother and the daughter. So the reason Stan did this, the reason he filmed this is because uh, he's said that if he wasn't focused on filming he'd probably end up fainting which is a fair point i probably would too in a way this is pretty much the prequel to the actor seeing with one's own eyes uh it might be a small baby now but eventually it will go on to run its full cycle of life and that's exactly what he meant birth sex death and the search for god now you're probably wondering where the search for god is because so far we've hit birth we've hit sex and we've hit death where is the search for god well that comes into the next short film. The next short film starts off the series of short films in which Stan basically stopped using cameras for, for a little bit. And the start of this is the most famous Stan Brakhage film of all time. Not, not, not his masterpiece, not his most infamous controversial ones. This is the movie that everyone thinks of when they think of Stan Brakhage. This is moth -like. Seemingly at random, the wings and other bits of moths and insects move rapidly across the screen. Most of them are brown or sepia. Up close we can see patterns within the wings, similar to the veins in the leaf. Sometimes the images look like paper cutouts, like Matisse. Green objects occasionally appear. Most of the wings are translucent. So this is the greatest example of body horror in history, and there will never be a greater example to exist 
and I'm standing by that, okay? You gotta understand, the way he made this was he took pieces of moths and other insects and laid them on the scotch tape, and then later the tape was transferred onto the film, making it one of the most disturbing examples of a three-minute avant-garde film. Now, the real, the, the, the real reason I say this is a, a body of horror is because he took a bunch of dead insects, okay, dead creatures, he ripped their bodies to pieces, took their, their pieces, their limbs, took their body parts, glued them together, and then put them onto a 35 millimeter projection. And the reason that people will line up at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City to see this on a 35 millimeter projection reel is because the 35 millimeter projector, when you get it going, you turn it on and you begin the reel, it does that thing where it goes. Stan said that that noise sort of mimics the sound of insects and, and, and wings flapping, which is exactly why this is the greatest example of body horror in history, because instead of taking a video of a bunch of moths flying around, instead of taking audio recordings, wings beating and insect pieces moving together as, as a living, breathing collective, he took dead things glued them together and then created a mechanical false noise. He ripped them apart and reconstructed the way he saw them. And if that is not Cronenberg as fuck, then I don't know what else is. This is the greatest example of body horror in history. And again, there will never be a greater example to exist. This is his magnum opus. This is the one that people think of when they think of Stan Brakhage. This is Mothlight. Next up is Eye Myth. I myth is funny because uh, so basically after the title it's like a white screen and it gives way to a series of frames that are suggestive of abstract art. There's two figures in the jungle in this. One of them is a shirtless man who appears twice and the other one is a an older person that that is suggested he's kind of on the the uh, the upper right foreground this one's funny though because well it is an eye myth the figures act as myths you know it's a truly visual myth it's unreal it's untruthful it also very real and very truthful the whole thing it feels like a flicker of honesty in a room full of false lights and sights um but really what i think is interesting about this so it, it's a 13 second short film right okay 240 frames per second it's I think 420p, maybe 480. So it's really interesting because you could take this, right? You can take IMIF and you can transfer it to GIF format. And you can watch it as a GIF and not lose anything. Okay, like you can pull up the YouTube version, the GIF version, the DVD version, and the Blu ray version and watch all of them on four different screens at the exact same time and it will not change quality. It's just that fascinating. Next up is The Wold Shadow, a stand of birches. Sunlight brightens and dims. There's a uh, revealing more uh, or less of the woods. There's some grass that's on the forest floor. Uh, and then suddenly you'll start to see shapes. Something green is out of focus. There's lights that flash and go dark from time to time. You look up at the bark of the trees. The whole suggestion is, is the god of the forest to be seen? Now, I didn't know you could paint in time lapses, but then again, that was kind of Brackage's whole thing, right? painting in unconventional ways, showing you things you didn't think about. For example, you didn't think about the deity of the forest. There's a whole bunch of figures and shapes in the trees, and I'm assuming you didn't spot most of them. Well, they're there. They're just moving, hiding, and adding an almost mystical, spiritual idea to this landscape painting. Again, the search for God. He has put God and deities and these larger figures and shapes and mysterious ideas into this video, into this, this film. You just have to look for them. You literally have to search for God. The Garden of Earthly the lights is a collage of two-dimensional images such as vegetation which each appear only for a moment sometimes it is a single image but more often than not with other bits of leaf bud petal or stem often we only see the outline of some objects as against a black background black and green are occasionally joined by fragments of white or orange and the objects in the frame don't really move but they are quickly replaced by another collage which gives a feeling of rapid motion each collage is notably very crisp especially for brackage's work the lines are etched into the background of black and later white. Although there's no soundtrack, the rapidity of the changing images and colors suggests there's a riot. Which is interesting because the name of this film, uh, The Garden of Earthly Delight, is a reference to the painting of the same name by Hieronymus Bosch, which is a post-medieval oil painting of the Garden of Eden, Hell, and Earth. Where Brackage's foliage and vegetation seem to match with each other and riot against the light, Bosch's sexually deviant humans do the exact same thing. Both are 
raging against the light of their god. The stars are beautiful. Now this is one of my least favorite of his, especially here on this collection. Stars are beautiful is just moving back and forth between scenes of a family at home and Brackage's thoughts and narrations about the stars and about creation. His children hold chickens while adults clip their wings and then we switch and see a forest. Uh, there's a narrator who talks about stars and light and eternity. There's a dog that joins the family. Narrator explains the heavens. We see beads of close. There's a narrator who suggests that it's a metaphor for heavenly bodies. Blah, 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 blah. Really, this is just, you know, uh, it's an artist-inspired ramblings while his children do their chores and go about their lives, which is interesting because it is a disconnect between a father and children. You know, it, it is a split between artists and those around him. Also, his ramblings match those of his children in a way. You know, though, though he is separate, he is more like them than anyone. Uh, paternal poetry, but really, really stupid, and I don't like his films that have sound because he really sucks at sound. And yeah. Kindering. So refracted images, uh, not unlike those in a funhouse mirror, display two children playing in a backyard. A boy and a girl. There's a dog, there's a swing, there's a picket fence, and a big wheels trike. The grass is green and lush. The soundtrack mixes a chorus, swelling strings, and a child vocalizing. The effect is to idealize the images. Though youth may be fleeting, innocence is the rarest thing we have. I've always stood by that opinion. It leaves faster than youth. Often not staying more than a small handful of, you know, very essential years. We see Brackage's children in this the same way that he does, as small innocent creatures in the grass, singing, playing, and unaware of what may lie before them. Now this really makes you think about a whole lot of stuff, you know. If, that kind of fucks you up when you when you think about it too much, you know. And that's what his whole thing is. He makes these weird, short, little, obscure shorts, and you wouldn't give two thoughts to them unless you really, really sat down and cared enough to give two thoughts about them. Like for Kindring, it's it maybe just a short, short f visual of his children playing in a backyard. But when I see this, all I can think about is my not related to her, but my niece Clem. And basically how someday, at some point, she may find this video, or this channel, or the, the weird things I say, or the things that anyone says. And, you know, I can sit here and talk about innocence, and the search for God, and the film technique, and ideas of abstraction. And someday, she's probably going to listen to all of those words, and she will probably be conscious enough, and understanding, and knowledgeable enough to understand what they all mean. And that's a really weird thought because right now she's just this small little happy-go-lucky gremlin who just runs around and, and, and plays with everything. But, you know, innocence is the rarest thing we have. Eye Dreaming is a really sad one. Um, it's basically, it, it was done with a collaboration on, with uh, Joel Hartling, the musician. Uh, basically, phrases of Stephen Foster are set to music by Joe Hartling, and those are all set to uh, film in this autobiographical piece. There's a solitary female voice that is occasionally joined by a chorus that sings phrases of sorrows as we watch a solitary, lonely man in shadows in an unadorned house. He stretches out. He picks out his feet, and he walks across the room. He rocks his, in a chair. Occasionally, he watches two young children at play. The film sometimes speeds up. Handwritten words like dark void and waiting longing cross the screen. Film and phrases come often in short bursts. Outdoor, it looks gray and cold. This is another brackage with audio, but this one is actually good. I like the audio in this one. This one uses the audio to make the somber rooms even more quietly cold. All I see in this is my grandfather near the end of his life and all I see in this is possibly my own future. The Dante Quartet is a visual representation in four parts of one man's internalization of the Divine Comedy. Hell is a series of multicolored brush strokes against a white background. The speed of the changing images varies. Hell spit flexion or springing out of hell is on a smaller film stock, taking the center of the frame. Montages of color move rapidly with a star and the edge of the lighted moon briefly visible. Purgation is back to full frame, 
with blurs of occasionally flashing color that slow down and then freeze. From time to time, an endos, uh, a window or a face or a distinguishable odd visual is briefly displayed, but only for a, a small moment. In existence is song, colors swirl and then flash in and out of view. Behind the vivid colors are momentary glimpses of volcanic activity. Out of all the cameraless films that Brackage made, this one specifically is much more personal than his other ones. Dante Quartet is a hand-painted film that took him six years to make, and you can almost see the exhaustion in the frames as they slow down and then speed back up, trekking through purgatory in their own special, special way. My Music is a very, very short, silent, hand-painted piece. It was part of the three hand-painted films. Night Music was actually originally painted on IMAX, and it attempts to capture the beauty of sadness as the eyes have it when it's closed in meditation on sorrow. There's not much to say here. It's just short, cool, fun. RageNet is another one of Brackage's works of moving visual thinking. RageNet is a little different because it reminds me of the vibrant pioneering experiments of the European animators of the 1920s. It's really it is, it's animated. It looks drawn rather than painted. It looks like it has actual movement and life. It's truly a manifestation of rage and thinking. It's at an odd pace that jumps frantically at different times, and it is a remarkable piece of jittery anger and an almost purely animated short. Glaze of Cathex. This hand-painted work is easily the most minutely detailed ever given to me to do, for it traces, as best I'm able to, the hypnagogic after-effect of psychological cathexis as designed by Freud in his first and unfinished book on the subject toward a scientific psychology. Stand brackage. Cathexis is the Freudian noun that accounts for the energy that one spends while thinking about something, usually to detrimental effect. It borders on insane levels of obsession and is often discussed in the same discussion as libido, sexual fantasy, and romantic interest. To relate this to Brackage's works, this is the first of his films that I truly believe to be alive and breathing. It's writhing, wriggling, and tormented mental anguish. This glaze of obsession is poisoning the film itself, and all we can do is watch it scream. Delicacies of Molten Horror Synapse is four superimposed rolls of hand-painted, bi-packed television negative imagery that are edited so as to approximate the hypnagogue process whereby the optic nerves resist grotesque infusions of luminescent light. The names of his films are often way cooler than any of the others, but Brackage has an interesting eye. To mix images of film cells with burned out television negatives and a hypnagogic whirlpool of insanity is to follow all of his experimental shorts is to create something almost more videodrome than videodrome. More digital horror than anything ever done with a digital camera. This horror is so cosmic and set yet so man-made, so human. Even so, there really is no horror here. Only these televised splices of negatives are strung in such a way that they create a trance and it's an anxiety and simultaneous calmness. This almost shouldn't exist, and yet it does, and that is the beauty of abstract art and absurd images. Untitled for Marilyn. So this film is actually officially untitled, but it is referred to as For Marilyn due to the dedication that appears in the place of the title card. It's dedicated to Marilyn Brackage the filmmaker's second wife. Out of all of the 350 plus films that Stan made in his life, this was his personal favorite. There he is, searching for her, trying to find her, reaching out to seek her face and touch her. She is what he travels the stars for. She is who he divides the subconscious for. She is his love and someday I hope I get to make something like this for someone that I love, someone someone to share a cathexis with. Although there is a brackage reference in the movie uh, Me and Earl and the Dying Girl and uh, every time I see it I, I, I see the ending of that movie and, 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 I, and I think about Greg's little film and all I can think about when I see the little film is about Brackage and his wife and how this movie meant so much to his wife and how it eventually would go on to mean so much for the rest of us who get to see and experience it. Black Ice is inspired by a bad fall on a patch of, well, black ice. Resulted in Brackage's need for eye surgery. 
The filmmaker gives us something of a dreamlike descent through fear and refractions of closed eye vision regarding such an event. Studying color black and white is exactly what you think it is. It's just painted images that are black and white and colored that just kind of flash for a, a little bit. You know, sometimes it's pointless to write things about things. Sometimes things say what they need to and that's enough for them. And that should be enough. Stellar. So Stellar is a hand-painted film that's been photographically step printed in order to achieve various effects of brief fades and fluidity of motion and uses a partial effect of painted frames and repetition for close-up of texture. The tone of the film is primarily dark blue and the paint is composed and rephotographed microscopically to suggest galactic forms in the space of stars. I want to hang every frame of this on my wall and tattoo every painted moment of this on my skin. Stellar is a journey through the cosmos, a simple idea. It's an easy production and a breathtaking aftermath. Out of all of the films that he made without a camera, I think Stellar is my favorite. Even though I, I totally gassed up Mothlight, I have such a fascination with For Marilyn and the delicacies of Molten Horror Synapse, I truly believe that Stellar is my absolute favorite. Crack Glass Eulogy is a nostalgic envisionment of city living, potential shards of memory as seen on the verge of cutting the mind to pieces. This is a rare case for Brackage because it's one of the few collaborations he did with a musician. There's no attempt to sync the music with the video though. Rather, the two elements just kind of flow parallel to each other, offering a divided and odd experience. This short, however, is a good representation of looking at your life through memory. It's dark and murky, and sometimes the shapes are abstract rather than concrete, but there's glimpses of buildings, water, and movement in them that help you build the whole thing up. This just is basically just seeing things through a mental projector. It's a sort of nostalgia. Dark Tower. So this hand-painted, step-printed film begins with streaks of light and vibrantly colored form. There appears to the frame of the center a tapered shape of a tower, an imposing silhouette against the backdrop of the flaring sky. To the average viewer, Stan Brackish makes the same film over and over again. To the obsessed, pretentious fanboy, i.e. me, Stan Brackage is a master of one of the key elements that holds his films together as individual and also as separate texture. The Dark Tower's light leaks and stained anarchy and brilliant use of silhouettes give us celluloid visions of bubbling blistered glass. It's warped and sharp and it's so fascinating to watch them all churn and melt all over the screen. And the tower shadows are also super menacing and really cool. Commingle Containers is another one that I really don't care for. Um, it's a return of photography, which was made after several years of only working on painted film strips, and it was made on the eve of his cancer surgery as a kind of last testament, if you will. It's an envisionment for the fleeting complexity of the worldly phenomenon. Brackage's visions aren't for everyone. You know, some I love, some of them I appreciate, and some of them I look at just for face value. And this one is one that I look like, one that I look at for what it is. You know, it's a video of light traveling through water. And if there is something deeper and something more spectacular than that, then feel free to let me know in the comments. But I cannot personally see it. Now, I can see the effect that only working with painted stills did on him. I mean, this is almost like he created an abstract, man-made image for so long that it distorted his own views of nature, and that's pretty dope. But outside of that, there's not a whole lot of value in this for me, personally. Alright, so finally, the last one on here is Love Song. Stan's visuals are usually sharp, bubbling, cracking, stabbing, threatening, and a mixing of acidic, pure cosmic pathos, but not here. See, here Stan has taken his painted frames to a more sensual territory. These images are soft, they're wet, they're glistening, but they're not boiling. They're pastel in places and even more shoegaze in other work. One letterbox user actually referred to it as glistening with harlequin intentions, which is such a dope lyric and I cannot wait to steal it. But this is just another romantic piece done by Stan for his wife. Conclusion of this whole thing is that Stan Brackage was an incredible artist and someone who decided to use strips of film to write philosophy. With his own cellular poetry, he destroyed what many people thought of the format at the time. I mean, no one thought to combine the things that he did and the ways that he did, and that's partially what makes him so special. The other thing that makes him special is that he didn't like using actors, and instead he preferred to use himself, his wives, and his children to tell the stories they had envisioned. From birth, to life, to sex, to death, to even the ideas of nature and God, Brackage used himself, his memories, and the world around him to look inside of himself and find the galaxies both within and without him. 
and that is beautiful. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching. Uh, if you want me to do volume two of By Brackage, let me know and I will go ahead and start working on that. Uh, I'm going to be doing a very, very brief video on something, I hope, coming up soon. Also hoping to finally release an older video. Uh, but realistically, I'll see you all in like four months from now because uh, the fuck promises in an actual schedule. Peace.